Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached verse 29 of chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? We're going to talk about context. I've talked a lot about that, uh, this, the subject, the entire subject of the 15th chapter is the resurrection of Christ. Uh, more than that, just dealing with the entire subject of, of the resurrection is, and how it relates to both Christ as well as ourselves. And I think it's important, folks, right from the very outset, if we're going to begin, pick up back here, we're going to have to keep in mind the context it's I've, I've mentioned this a lot it really confuses a lot of christians uh the idea being that that uh, it's it's sort of looked at each you know you pick out a verse or you read a verse and you look at it and you interpret it in light of no context now, i don't know if that makes any sense but uh, you know even in our normal conversation with one another uh, there's always a context, you know, maybe uh, sometimes we'll slip up and throw in something that sort of will take a rabbit trail, you know, and we'll talk about something else and then come back and talk about what we were talking about. It, it appears that that's what's happening here in this verse, uh, you know, baptized for the dead. I mean, what does that have to do with the resurrection? What does that have to do with the context? And I'm trying to really push to that point that context is so important that we have to look at that verse in light of the overall context. And that really shouldn't uh, surprise people. I, I'm, I'm hoping this will really help people in their study of the Word. Now in John chapter 5, the Lord said that there are two resurrections. There's the resurrection of those who've done good to the resurrection of life, and then there's the resurrection of those who've done evil. Uh, that's the resurrection of damnation. So there's two. Now the first resurrection is completed. Uh, we found in the, the book of Revelation uh, that that first resurrection consists of the resurrection of Christ, the first fruit, singular. Then those that are His at His coming, thats that was verse 23. Every man in his own order, uh, every man in his own group. Uh, the word order there means group. Christ the first fruit, that's the first resurrection. Uh, Christ the first fruit. Then they that are Christ said is coming. Uh, that's another group, but it's still the first resurrection if you follow what I'm saying. And so we get down to verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the death and right away our sort of fleshly carnal minds want to go to you know this strange sort of thought that well maybe that means getting baptized for some other poor lost soul you know you get out of the river you get baptized for your uncle charlie because he he didn't get bad folks the context hasn't changed You know, ministers get up and they say, you know, you, 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 you can just see Paul. He's laboring there. He's writing this and he's, he's tired. So he goes and he gets a cup of coffee and he comes back and he sits down and he forgets where he was and he writes this verse completely out of context. Now, I don't know how that, that many commentators can say that. You know, how can you say that this, you know, are you, you know, this is Paul's word. Is that what we're saying? This is not God's word. It's Paul's word. You know, he, he, he got up, got a cup of coffee. It interrupted his train of thought. Folks, 
I believe this to be God's Word, not Paul's. Paul wrote it, but God authored it. Paul is writing down what the author wanted written down, and God, I don't believe God, he's, I don't believe he's left the subject of Christ being raised. In fact, the entire chapter from beginning to end concerns itself with one subject, and that is the resurrection. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And we automatically want to think water, bring water into this. And this is where I hope this will help people. This is a verse where many have said, you know, Paul just lost his train of thought, forgot where he was. So he comes back, you know, this verse is out of context and nobody knows really what it means. I don't know what to tell you. I can tell you that, th I can tell you this, I can tell you that 200 people have come up with over 200 meanings for this one verse of Scripture. As far as I know, it ranks number one. One of the leading commentators today gives two possible meanings, and then he says, after he gives his, his two meanings, he says, well, let me close by saying, I have no idea what this verse means. Now, I probably ought to close the same way. Uh, I don't know what it means, but I think that I can grasp some meaning, uh, and, and I think I can do that because I'm, I'm going to stay in context. I don't think the verse is out of context. The question started way back in this chapter. If Christ is preached that He rose from the dead, why are some of you saying, there's no resurrection of the dead. That's a problem in Corinth. I mean, listen, it's a problem in your city. You know, it's so easy for people, you know, to give tacit recognition to the resurrection of Christ and never believe it. There aren't very many who seriously comprehend the grand truth that Christ Jesus, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, became man, died a criminal's death, died a death that you couldn't die, and actually rose again from the dead and is exalted at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Baptizo is the word in the Greek. Baptizo is a Greek word that includes the idea or, or, it, or it teaches the idea that any single thing that is able to bring something else under its control and direction baptizes it. You know, like the ocean baptizes a ship when it takes the ship under its control and the ship sinks. And we know that we have been baptized into Christ. We've been identified with Christ. Just like that ship was identified with the sea when it sank. And God did that baptizing. That was a spiritual baptism, folks. I mean, he, that was a spiritual baptism. He will be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. And folks, that's only possible if He rose from the dead. On the other hand, I mean, bear the context in mind. What shall they do? Well, who is the they? These people who are saying that there is no resurrection from the dead. What shall they do if they have identified themselves with the dead? That is, with Christ. Okay. If He doesn't rise from the dead, why are they then baptized? Why are they... If Christ didn't rise from the dead, why are they identifying themselves with Christ? Why, why identify yourself with Christ if He didn't rise from the dead? Now, folks, I, I believe that's simply what the verse is, is saying. I think it's a, 
a shame to call yourself a Christian if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead. You know, who, you know, somebody who who not only doesn't believe it, but doesn't receive it and doesn't grasp its significance. I think it's a shame. But we haven't gotten to that verse yet. That's that's verse 34. Folks, keep in mind that God wrote this. This is not Paul's reasoning, his logic. Why are they identified present participle? It's a present participle. With, with that Christ, if they don't believe that the dead rise. And in addition, because we believe that the dead rise, because we believe that Christ rose from the dead, Paul says, we're standing in jeopardy every hour. Why do that if Christ didn't rise from the dead? Why are we, we standing in, here in, in danger? Okay, uh, Actual physical danger. Verse 30, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Verse 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Now the Greek reads, here's how the Greek reads. It says, every day I die. That is a present tense. Okay? As surely as, as the 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 in you boasting brothers which I have in Christ Jesus, the Lord of us. I, I stand in jeopardy every hour. I die continuously because of my rejoicing which I have in you. That's what the, I believe the verse is saying. In Christ, in Jesus our Lord. A risen Christ. If, if you took the resurrection out of, out of the situation, if you took it out of the context, none of the disciples would have died a martyr's death. Paul wouldn't have had all the problems that he had. All the sufferings of those early uh, Christians would have never happened if there hadn't been a resurrection. Identifying yourself with a risen Christ back then was a dangerous thing. Well, it still is today. It depends on where you live. But it still is today. But there's also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11, where Paul says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That's also a present tense, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Present tense. I face death every day because of my rejoicing in you in Christ Jesus. And, and that's what the resurrection does. This book, folks, the Bible stands on, rests upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is the primary chapter that deals with it. If you recognize it, you stand, you stand solid for the truth, you're going to be surrounded by wild beasts. Verse 32. It's just that they, they, just, may be, they just may be walking on two legs. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what, what, is, what does it advantage me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Physical confrontation over truth is what I see here. Not some, you know, fighting lions in the Colosseum in Rome or, you know. If after the, men, the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus. This is one of the, the particulars of, of danger that Paul faced constantly. Uh, and, and there are many... Many good Bible students that, try, that look at this in the figurative sense and they think that by beasts, that, that means Satan, the roaring lion, uh, his principalities his, and powers. Uh, Nero was a, a lion by Paul. I have fought with beastly men at Ephesus 
after the manner that men fight with beasts, exposing my body to their rage and fury, exposing myself to their insults, their beatings, their whippings, their stoning, whatever, stonings, whatever. So what profit is it to me if the dead rise not? What profit would all that be? Well, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any. Dearly beloved, if Christ isn't raised, what profit is there in you fighting such beasts who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead? The good fight of faith. Paul wrote to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Okay, We're, we're looking at interaction between pe people here. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Second Peter chapter 2. I don't think this is talking about Paul fighting lions in the Colosseum at Rome. I believe this should be understood as a reference to the evil spirits or beasts at, at work in the demon-possessed sorcerers and idolaters of Ephesus during Paul's time. Verse 33, Be not deceived, evil communication corrupts good manners. That's the words companions, actually, uh, in the Greek. Uh, companions. Be, be not con deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. That's verse 33. Verse 34, awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. That word knowledge there means is actually it's not gnosko, it's the word is ignorance. Ah, uh, gnosko, it's without knowledge, it's ignorance. Uh, I speak this to your shame. Uh, and I'll say it again if. Uh, I think it's shameful to profess to be a Christian and not believe Jesus rose from the dead. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. If you hang around with people, folks, who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, well, you're not in good company. I believe that's what the verse is saying. So we're staying in context. We have all the way down through. We're not leaving the context. He's not changing. The Holy Spirit's not his thought, thought processes are not changing. He's not changing subjects. You, you can go down all the way through the chapter. You get to the end of the chapter. You see at the end of the chapter, he hasn't changed subjects at all. And I think that is extremely important. It's a good example of what I've tried to, to help people with and in, 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 in they're trying to understand uh, verses as they go through sections of, of the Word, portions of Scripture, or that they get a little little lost, they get a little confused, they don't understand what this is talking about. The first thing that you want to do is stop and ask yourself, what's the context? Because it's a tremendous help. I mean, you're, you're looking at the context, and then and when you do that, it seems to all fall into place. It's not, it, it isn't seen as something foreign to the context. Awake to righteousness. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we, 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 uh, now, now we're to strive to become righteous? Well, of course not. Uh, awake, uh, what would be the opposite of that? It would be asleep. Uh, 
It's you're not you're not uh, you're not aware. You're not you're not you haven't come to the realization of the fact of what righteousness truly is. That it's that all righteousness is of the Lord. That the word righteous itself is from the word justice. That God is just. Uh, the word just. The word righteous. Same word. Same word in, in the Greek. Uh, God is just. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's only one who is righteous. All righteousness is of the Lord. We don't have any righteousness in and of ourselves. What, what has happened here is we've become partakers of His life, His righteousness. We've been made the righteousness of God in Him, but the only way that could happen would be if Christ rose from the dead. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Now we're back under the law, so just go out. Y'all folks, that just go, go. Today I want you to go about your day and try really hard not to sin. Not to allow that old fleshly, that, those fleshly lusts to dominate and control your, your day. I mean, you know, was, we're just back under the law. Just, just stop sinning. Stop sinning. Y'all stop sinning. That's not what it's saying. What I'm seeing is in the context, a particular sin which deals with the subject of being ignorant, not, not believing Christ rose from the dead, not believing the effects of that resurrection and what that resurrection paved the way for in our lives, which is our becoming the righteousness of God in Christ. Folks, we've got to trust Him concerning what He says is true. And we know that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It is sin. Uh, Christians have the whole wrong idea about sin. If, if, you, if you are going about your day-to-day -day life thinking that you're trying to appease, it is your job to appease some angry God, if, if you're of the mind that you, the whole entire Christian life is summed up in the words try do the best try to do the best you can and maybe god will will accept you you know maybe maybe you won't maybe maybe you'll please him maybe you won't if that's your idea of it you're not tr you're really trusting god concerning the word his word concerning what he has said is true of you that we're not under law that we're under grace whatsoever is not of faith is sin For some do not have the knowledge of God. The word is, is they're, they're, they're lacking knowledge. It's, it's, it's ah, gnosko. It's, it's ignorance of the word of God. And I speak this to your shame. And we need to stop right there. That's, I don't know how many, that was 34 verses from 29. 29 to 34. That's five verses where we haven't left the context. It all seems to flow together nicely. It does seem to make a lot of sense. But only when we look at it from the standpoint of the context. Uh, we can pick just about any verse in the Bible and make it say whatever we want to say if we ignore context. I hope this helps many of you I, I, as you as you go about your, your, your studies. I wanna thank you so much for your continued interest in what we're doing here and what we're trying to do, uh, which is actually uh, through doctrine, deliver those who've been held in, in man-made bondage to the law, to sin, self, the law, the world. Uh, dearly beloved, He loves us with an undying love. He's, uh, he's granted you uh, great and us. He's granted us, He's given us great and sp special promises that by these promises we can become partakers of the divine nature. Uh, the more we grow in Christ, grow in grace and knowledge of Christ, 
the more we find out it's about him, it's not about us at all. I've often said if, if, all we, if all we did was just give thanks to God for all that he's done for us in Christ, and folks, keep in mind, none of that would be possible if it were not for Christ having raised from the dead. Uh, if that's all we did was just give thanks every day for everything that God is, who He is, what He's doing, what He's done, what He is doing, what He will do in our lives, we wouldn't have time to gripe and complain or do anything else. Uh, if that's all we did, and we, and we are told to give thanks in all things, we're told to be content in all circumstances. This is a wonderful chapter dealing with the resurrection. We're, we're, we're most certainly not through with it yet. There's, there's still quite a few verses left in chapter 15. Uh, I just want to thank you all for your continued participation. I want to thank you for your messages, your, your, uh, your comments of uh, encouragement, your love, your support. Uh, rest in Him, folks. Rest in Him. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So thankful for, for who you are. So thankful for that you, you died in our place, that you rose from the dead. We, we understand that, that everything that we know in life is just, it all hinges on the fact that you rose from the dead. We just give you all the the honor and all the glory, sealed of our hearts that which is truth, but only in only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.